afternoon to the beautiful, the people of the beautiful city of Adankolu. Can I have my slide up, please? If you had the, if you had a reason to access medical care and you were given the option of two professionals, this professional or this. Now tell me, who would you choose? Before you go ahead to answer that question, let me tell you a story. A nine-year-old made a visit to a psychologist in the state of New York. And his parents desperately wanted this man to be able to help their lovely son to heal or get back to normal. However, this was not the first, second, third, or even fourth visit that they have had to a psychologist. And now they hoped that this man would be able to help this boy out. This fateful day, the man's dog, Jingles, mistakenly was in session. And then, a few minutes later, the man discovers that this boy is effortlessly talking to the dog. One of the major things that the parents have sought for from many professionals and for a long while. This was the official birth of what is known in the Western world today as the human-animal interactions, which largely is defined by the American Veterinary Medical Association as, defined by the American Veterinary Medical Association as any form of interaction that helps animals and humans to be able to bond in mutually beneficial ways that helps in the emotional, psychological, and physical aspects of the well-being of humans and animals. HAI, human-animal interactions, works in one of two ways, professionally. The first is animal-assisted interventions, and the other is assistance or service animals. I will define animal-assisted interventions simply as any form of intervention where an animal partners with a human service professional, or I will call that the human-centric professional here, who brings in an animal or a representation of an animal while working with a patient or a client to help them to heal or to teach them. In this, you could have an animal working with one person at a time, or one animal working with various people. Now, assistance, an assistance animal or a service animal is an animal that is specifically trained to perform tasks to help a person who has a physical, psychological, or other form of disability or need to help that person to be able to heal or to help that person perform certain tasks. For animals that do serve in the whole um, assistance animal space could sometimes have role-specific titles. For example, an autism service dog, which is paired with a child or a person that has autism. Or we could also have a seen eye dog that is paired with someone who is blind and helps the person through daily life. Part of the mechanisms that the science world and experiences of many people that have gone through this have used to explain the benefits of it is a number of mechanisms, one of which is the fact that the biochemical effect of this on human beings, of contact with an animal, is such that it helps to reduce the level of the stress hormone in human beings, cortisol, and helps to increase our happy or feel-good hormones. One of the things that this effect does for us as human beings is that it helps to lower the blood pressure. It helps us to also be able to overcome anxiety or other such psychological issues and helps us to overcome depression. Another thing that animals could help us do or that this phenomenon could help us do as well is that animals could be very good at detecting an, a potential emotional overload even before it happens in humans and then the animal could step up in loving, gentle, and calming ways to be able to help the person to 
let me use the language, diffuse the tension or emotion before it even occurs. A third way that this helps is the fact that animals could serve as what is known as social lubricants. That is, they help to facilitate conversations, sometimes even with strangers that we've never met, and then help us to build meaningful relationships. A fourth that I would mention here right now as well is the fact that animals help us to deal with all various forms of issues in our lives. And so it is very important that we take this um, form of intervention seriously. Some of the animals that, um, some of the segments of people, sorry, that this has worked for over the years are, I'll mention a few, people with autism or other special needs conditions, people with psychological or mental health issues, for example, anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, the aged, people who are disabled, and there's so many more. Some animal species that have worked in this excellently well are, for example, dogs and horses, which are the most popular animals. But other examples include animals such as cats, goats, horses, donkeys, and a host of others. One thing worthy of note here anyway is the fact that it is not advisable to bring in animals that are largely considered as wildlife into this mix, especially because of the potential for harm to humans or the potential for zoonosis, which is the spread of disease between humans and animals. You may hear everything I say right now and you will feel like this is just a Western concept, something that works somewhere out there in the US or some other place. Let me first of all remind you that one of the first things we connect with as human beings from when we're born is nature. I'll give an example, and especially nature in the sense of animals. My son, when he was a bit younger, a year old thereabouts, and didn't even know what they were or could even say any of those, would rather prefer to watch cartoons such as Peppa Pig, Paddington, or Paw Patrol than watching regular television contents that had human faces. I'll give a quick story of Kochi, the old football coach, retired football coach that I met when I was in Calabar serving. Kochi was someone who usually brought his dog, Tyson. And Tyson, by the way, is a big dog. And he would usually bring Tyson on a regular basis for health checks and vaccinations. On one of those days, I asked Kochi why he always takes this dog. He moves around Calabar literally everywhere he goes with this dog. He spends every last dime he has on Tyson. And I asked him on this day, why? In his words, I owe my life to this dog. Why? Apparently, a few years earlier, he went into shock one evening, alone in his room. And then Tyson would pace back and forth when he noticed this to the other room in the house that had people and then come back again. He goes back to the other room. He barks to get the attention and comes back. Eventually, the people in the other room decided to follow the dog and try to understand why exactly this unusual behavior. They followed and voila. Suffice to say that the doctor told Kochi that if he had not been brought in that night, he may never have survived past that night. Now, before I continue, please, by show of hands, can you let me know if you've ever had a negative experience with an animal, especially a dog, if you've ever been bitten, chased, whatever else that may have made you to? <laughs> Fantastic. So I'm speaking to the right audience. <laughs> OK. So let me go back to talking about myself as a child. And as a child, my father made sure that while we were growing up, we always had at least one dog in our family. And then the first, one of the first veterinarians from my tribe, the late Dr. Stephen Achema, traveled to the UK once. He brought back some trained German Shepherd puppies, and he gave my father one of those. That particular dog, Skipper, changed our lives forever. There was a lot that we did with him as children that our childhood experiences would never be complete without the mention of Skipper. Now, before I go into saying what I want to talk about right now, I would love to 
give this analogy, which I mostly do, and it's the fact that back in the days when we mostly had manual gear vehicles, for most cars, if you needed to put the car on reverse, you will take the gear all the way to the right and backwards. For a few cars, however, and I think if I remember correctly, Mercedes was one of those. If you needed to put it on reverse, you will take the gear all the way to the left and forwards. Now, the question is, if you got a Mercedes, or if you were to drive one, and then you wanted to put it on reverse, and you took the gear all the way to the right and backwards, whose fault is it? Is it the fault of the car, or is it the fault of the person who is to drive the car, or maybe even the owner of the car, who did not take time to understand the functionality of this particular car? And by this, I would say, or apply that to say that this is the, more often than not, the most important reason why you may have had most of the negative experiences that you may have had with animals. And that is to say that we, either you or the owner or whoever may not have adhered to the animal welfare tenets, or probably let me also say the five freedoms of animal welfare, or even another concept to re referred to as responsible pet guardianship. I would apply this to Kochi's story to say if, for example, Kochi um, kept the dog as the regular Nigerian would, and Tyson was a dog in the cage every day, and then he comes out at night just to protect the compound and everything. If he did not train and socialize Tyson really well to be able to interact with him and everyone else in public without causing harm, if he also did not bond with Tyson, that particular night, may have been Kochi's final day on planet Earth. And so, coming back specifically to human-animal interactions, in 2018, we decided to do an assessment trial to see if, beyond the fact that this works out there, if this is even of potential to work in Nigeria. And we visited a special needs center in Abuja with our dogs. That's a picture of our, one of the, of the session that day. And beyond the fact that all the children that were there were really happy to see the dogs and everything, one thing that caught our attention that was told to us by the teachers and therapists on site was the fact that this was of breakthrough potential for two boys who were present there that day. And I mean breakthrough potential because these are two boys who were usually expressionless. And the teachers and Therapists are usually seeking for a motivating factor for each child to use that as a source of learning or growth for the child. But here we were with our dogs, and these two boys were smiling, they were happy, they were in that moment ready to do just about anything the teachers and everyone else said to be able to get an opportunity to play with our dogs. At the same time, in that space, these two boys were equally communicating with us, with other children, with the teachers. Next slide. So how can we get HAI, that is human animal interactions, to take center stage as one of the therapeutic options for us in Nigeria and in Africa? I would first of all like to say that we need to realize that HAI is one of the things that function under the One Health framework. By One Health, we mean that, yes, we may be focusing on the health and well-being of the humans, but then if we also neglect the health and well-being of the animals, as well as neglect the health of the environment, then the success of this is at risk. And then coming now to be able to give a few recommendations, the first of which would be to say that we need to have a mind shift as Nigerians or as Africans from seeing animals as only a source of protection to knowing that we can have a mutually beneficial experience or existence with animals that would be of benefit to our health and well-being as well as that of the animal. We also need to see animals as sentient beings, that is recognizing the fact that these are beings of feeling as well, and which goes back again to the animal welfare that I talked about earlier to knowing and being able to find out, research, whatever else we need to do, to find what their needs are, and to be able to meet their needs 
as well as do everything that we require for them to live in our world and for us to have a good relationship. It is also important for the human-centric professionals, the professionals on the human angle, which could be psychologists, therapists, doctors, teachers, to be able to, and as well as the um, animal-centric professionals, which for example would be veterinarians, animal scientists, veterinary nurses. It is important for these to be able to build the, their knowledge and competence by taking courses, by investing in continuing education, and whatever else will be able to help them to gain the required knowledge and skills for their role-specific jobs in that particular field or sector. Finally, I would also recommend that any professional who wants to get into this space or who steps into this space or any organization should equally seek out for international associations that serve as um, standard-setting organizations or that equally serve as associations that help to connect people in different parts of the world that do this work. And if some of those organizations include Animal Assisted Interventions International, AAII, International Association for Human-Animal Interactions Organizations, Society for Companion Animal Studies, and a host of others. In 2004, my nephew Joshua was born. And when he grew to be like two, three years old, we discovered that he was different. He couldn't speak like, he couldn't even utter any coherent words, and a whole lot of others, other things that we noticed. Unfortunately, at the time, there was no professional that could explain to us what exactly was wrong with Joshua. Unfortunately, he died in 2013, nine years later. And then two years after that, I came across the video on the internet of Nathan Selov, an American who I want to believe had the same condition that my nephew had. And he was diagnosed with autism, specifically Asperger's syndrome. His parents sought out solution, and then they found an autism service dog for him named Sylvia. Today, Nathan is doing extremely well for himself, and he has accomplished a lot. He is today living a normal life. He is now a professor of communication, and he's married to his beautiful wife, Jess. So it is my hope, my desire, my dream, my vision to see how people with special needs in Nigeria, which is our focus group as an organization, or people with whatever other need that may be able to benefit from HAI, will be able to experience this and have eventual life outcomes like that of Nathan Selov. And this hope and desire has pushed me to be able to see how I would put in effort to pioneering this in Africa, from Nigeria to Ghana to Kenya to Botswana, or every other place that our voice or presence has reached. Now the question is, and I would also put at this point that um, Nathan made a statement that I love so much. He said, if I could take a pill and cure myself, I would not do it because I now see autism for what it really is, a gift. The question is, can animals help us in Nigeria and in Africa to be able to live a better quality life than they may have done for someone like Nathan. Thank you.